There are problems that affect so many, and yet so few talk about them. Which is why Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg and Moshe Yachnis bring you Out of the Shadows, a Jewish approach to mental health. Rabbi Goldberg and Moshe speak to leaders in the field and discuss contemporary challenges to help us better understand mental health and those who are struggling with it. This month's topic, anxiety. On this episode, we are joined by Dr. David H. Rosmarian, Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School and Founder and Director of the Center for Anxiety, and by Jessica and Eitan, two individuals sharing their own struggles with anxiety. We hope you find this episode meaningful and helpful, and be sure to check out the show notes for further resources. Welcome back to Out of the Shadows, a Jewish approach to mental health. We're so grateful to be here with you for episode two in our monthly podcast, trying to tackle and take on mental health issues to break the stigma, break the shanda, break the shame, and really get conversations going. I couldn't be more excited to continue to partner with you, Moshe, uh, not only online through this podcast, but our work offline between the Boca Raton Synagogue and, and your amazing program, Onward Living, the ADOPT, which is the union between the two and what we're trying to do together. So maybe share a little bit more about about Onward and, and why a topic like anxiety, tonight's topic that we're really going to try to tackle together and with our guests, why is that relevant to somebody who specializes in addiction? Yeah, so that's a great point. Again, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, Onward Living is a you know Jewish rehabilitation program. And, and like every good rehab, um, really, when you think in terms of somebody working through addiction or any mental health issue, um, so much of the solution it revolves around coming out of the shadows and really sharing that and validating and understanding what's going on with the individual. It's not just the behavioral intervention as far as stopping the, 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 you know, the dangerous behavior, but it's really understanding what's going on under the, under the hood. And Onward Living is a, it's a Jewish rehab where we've essentially created a platform where folks can get honest and can get vulnerable and share what's going on with themselves. Uh, they could come out of the shadows. Uh, that's really what it's about. Um, and, you know, throughout the different programs that we have, you know, the therapy, as well as we call the TC, a therapeutic community, is a rich environment for individuals to share and to get vulnerable with others. And so much of that is the solution. Um, whether a you see a lot of anxiety among, among those in that program? Sure. Or just I mean, anxiety your, is, your practice? is correct. Yeah. I mean, anxiety is one of the huge, I would say, you know, probably the, the number one indicator um, that, you know, every person struggles with anyone who struggles with you know addiction there's some kind of anxiety issue underneath that um whether it's an acute ocd presentation or, or mild um you know uncomfort when it comes to you know what's going to happen what's going to be a nervousness a concern a fear um there's no question about it that underneath addiction definitely lies anxiety which is why this podcast is so exciting because we're talking really to try to address all the issues that exist it's not just addiction um, anxiety. We really hope to go through over the next couple of months um, all the clinical presentations that we see. There's tons of research about. I'm excited to bring on, you know, individuals who are courageous enough to share their stories, as well as you know, some real professionals who understand that are that are living in a you know deep dive into that presentation. Um, and while there definitely is a corollary or an overlap, there's an enormous amount of mental health that doesn't lead to addiction or connected with addiction, right? So our yeah. guest tonight. Who are going to courageously share their story didn't ultimately come lead to some challenge with addiction, but anxiety was was the main issue and can be with OCD or depression or countless other areas that that many struggle with and are managing and thriving with without it ever needing to overlap with addiction. Correct. And the adopt is such a it, it, it is again an, another an opportunity for where we have you know, young men or old men that are going through addiction while in treatment, they want to experience a family system. They want to see and observe what does it look like a healthy unit? How can I integrate and not, and not be judged? And Boca Raton Synagogue has demonstrated over five and a half years of, you know, a non-judgmental environment for people to really come into their homes. Um, and it does so much. It empowers, Rabbi, every time I see you and we speak, um, it really empowers their work. And, it, and they're able to look in the mirror and say, yes, I'm an addict, I'm struggling with addiction, but I'm Jewish, and there's a home for me somewhere in Boca Raton. And through the ADOPT initiative, we're able to really pair up individuals with families uh, from the shul um, to really create uh, a holistic approach to the treatment that we provide. It's, so a, it's, it's uh, a great honor. It's a great yeah. honor to partner, and we definitely benefit. Our members who are opening their homes aren't just giving, they're, they're getting an enormous amount. So we're excited to get to our program, to get to our guests and our expert. But first, Moshe, from, from your experience as a clinician, and, and I certainly see it as a rabbi, um, so much of the rabbinic counseling that I do has to do with uh, people who are anxious 
whether yeah. it's clinical anxiety, people who are in distress or paralyzed, debilitated from their anxiety, or just a general anxiousness. Pesach's yes. coming, Sukkot is coming. We're seeing family. What do we do on Yeshiva week? My children in school, Shiduchim. There's a general anxiousness that really permeates the air. So, um, you know, take us into our episode and, and our interviews with some observations on anxiety. Sure. So anxiety is an emotion, right? And and just to, by way of introduction, what is an emotion? There are those who refer to emotions as an energy in motion, right? Every person, every individual is comprised of certain energy. We talk about the mind, body, and spirit. The spirit piece is the neshama, the lave. We'll leave that for a, a podcast onto its own. But, but when you think in terms of the mind and the body, right? Um, the mind, our thoughts are, is the language of the mind and our feelings is the language of the body. So when we have an emotion, it's really a, a combination of what the mind and the body is experiencing. Um, anxiety is, is such a beautiful um, expression of a mind body experience. Uh, when a person has a trigger that, that there's a, some kind of experience that they see or they hear uh, some kind of stimuli that triggers a thought um, and then their body has a reaction to that thought. We know that anxiety um, is really, a, a, you know, the fight or flight emotion uh, reaction is something that is um, a, a normal reaction. It's actually, it's, it's a kind of a, a defense mechanism to, per, you know, to perceived fear. Uh, it's actually a very healthy reality that happens. But sometimes if a person is in fight or flight mode on a continuum, that creates, that exhausts the body, right? Uh, think about if a person thinks they're gonna be attacked, right? So there's certain neurophysiological reactions that take place to protect the person, to defend off that perceived fear. If a person is in that feared state on a continuum, then the body exhausts itself. So again, I don't wanna oversimplify it, but I think it's, it's important to understand that anxiety is really a manifestation of mind and body. And you think of terms of anxiety, there's you know three or four, all anxiety disorders are first cousins with each other. Um, there, are, there are three or four, if I could just mention briefly, um, and then we'll, we'll talk more about uh, hearing from our guests, which type of anxiety disorder they, they struggle with. And obviously from the doctor regarding some, some statistics, um, we have general anxiety disorder, which is basically, um, you know, a constant state of fear, living in the unknown and concerned by that. Um, a person's, you know, they're, they're, they're hyper focused on what's going to be, what's going to happen. And when that happens on a continuum, then they're exhausting themselves and they're, they're constantly afraid. And then there's OCD, which is more of an acute um, manifestation of anxiety where and, and, and expresses itself through um, intrusive thinking and perhaps on a behavioral level as well. Again, I don't want to get into all the yeah, details. We'll do a whole OCD. episode on that. We'll do a whole Exactly. Correct. Um, and then you have, you know, post-traumatic distress disorder, which is another anxiety presentation of somebody that experienced an intense traumatic experience and their body and their mind live that experience. And obviously the treatment for that is very unique and very targeted to address understanding the trauma, understanding the experience and the body and the mind reaction to that experience. Um, and then you have social anxiety. Social anxiety is a trigger. You could have somebody on a one-on-one -on -one conversation where they have no problems interacting. When you put them in a group of people, they're paralyzed. The fear creates a freeze reality and they can't interact. And then the shame from that inability, people judge them, people laugh at them, they understand, they look themselves in the mirror and they see that they're, they're abnormal or they're struggling on some level. Um, and social anxiety is a huge um, component um, to what a lot of people struggle with. And uh, part of this discussion around anxiety is to give people some clarity. Uh, maybe they can identify what they're struggling with, maybe a variation um, on, on an acute level, on more of a baseline level as well. And again, the goal is to you know, to seek help, to have the conversation, so much of the solution is sharing it. And, and that's a, our hope in, in, in interviewing these people and really- Yeah, and I would, go, I would even go a step further, which is that unaddressed anxiety is responsible for so much damage. There are marriages that are over, relationships that are alienated or dissolved, business opportunities that get sabotaged uh, because of anxiety or anxiousness. And that's not to blame somebody who has it, but it's to talk about the possibility if it can be addressed and managed of how much more can go right, how much more can go well, how much more relationships and how much more people can thrive by managing it. And, and in, in my experience, just in life and, and also, you know, as a rub of a large shul is, 
there's clinical anxiety, there's anxiety of being in distress, and then there's just general anxiousness. You know, we, we're just coming out of a pandemic, and there's such uncertainty in life in general. It's almost impossible not to have some sense of anxiousness and the tools that build resiliency as the way to manage anxiousness, anxiety, are tools that absolutely everybody can benefit from. Um, we normally talk about in the Jewish world, two relationships, between us and God and between us and other people. But the most important relationship we have is it's the relationship we have with ourselves. And so much of building up the resiliency and the tools to manage anxious thoughts is all about our relationship with ourselves, how we manage and regulate ourselves. And the better we take care of ourselves, the better all the relationships we'll have in life. So really excited for this episode. So grateful to, to Jessica and Eitan for their courage and willingness to talk to us. Doctor has the data, the brilliance, the experience. And without any further ado, we're super excited to be able to, to bring them on. Good evening, uh, Jessica. Welcome to the show. So grateful that you uh, are here tonight. And uh, I just want to express uh, appreciation on behalf of Rabbi Goldberg and I, um, you know, after our first episode, um, you were one of the many people that reached out and, uh, you know, wanted to share a little bit about your story. And, and as you and I were speaking, uh, it, it triggered, you know, my, my invitation to come and join us and, and to really take your courage and share with others. Um, so we've, we've gotten so much feedback, positive feedback just around the introduction uh, mental health in our community and in, in, in general, uh, and specifically around anxiety. So you were one of many that reached out, and uh, I'm really excited to hear your story on this level and uh, see if we can really give some people language and clarity around the very complicated topic, um, and with some hope, some hope that there is a solution. There are people that are muscling through various different challenges um, and practical recommendations that they can take home with them, or at least continue the conversation at home because uh, there might be others around you that are still struggling um, with, with these issues. Absolutely, Jessica. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to echo and, and add our thanks for your courage. It's not easy to be willing to, to give a face and a voice. And our hope is that the people watching and listening will say either, you know, oh my goodness, that's what my life is like. And I'm so glad that someone's sharing it. Let's get rid of the stigma. Or I don't have that, but I'm so much more sensitive now. I really appreciate that people around me, what their life might be like. So let's start from the beginning. You, you know, don't go into to detail, but tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your life, because people can relate to and understand um, that, you know, you're not an exception. You're, you're somebody, you're one of us, you're one of many. Give us a little bit about your background and then we'll get into the particular life with anxiety. Okay, sure. First of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. It's really an honor and privilege. And I, I hope this conversation reaches people and, and shows a lot of those that are struggling that they're not alone. Um, I live in New York with my husband and five children. I have, I'm actually from New Hampshire. I did not grow up religious. And I found religion when I studied for a semester um, in Israel at Hebrew University. Um, I have been running a two-year-old daycare for the last 12 years. So I spend all day, every day with little people. It's a lot of fun, pretty exhausting. Um, and I also run a clothing for a clothing gamach for women and children in our community. Um, I'll get to that later, but chesed happens to be a very big coping skill for me through my own mental health journey. Um, and so, yeah, I, they're busy, busy, busy. Try to find time for self-care to breathe. And that's a little like bit everyone of Like else. Well, you're yeah. else, Jessica. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So in some ways, there's nothing exceptional. You know, you're mm -hmm. you're the average person who lives a Jewish life, a rich life, who manages life and work and, and family yeah. and Correct. trying to figure it out. Right, exactly. Yes. So take take us back to the beginning of, of when you started to feel these these feelings. Okay. So my anxiety journey really started when I was very, very young. I didn't know, that there was no name for it until I was in my 20s. Um, but since I was, I mean, obviously when you're young, a lot of it has to come from your parents, but I do remember constantly feeling debilitated by physical symptoms, especially when there was a change in routine. So I would have extreme stomach pain. Um, I would have horrible headaches. I would feel dizzy and I was constantly making my parents bring me back and forth to the doctor. I just, I never felt well especially when I was in social situations. I did push myself. So I was in dance competitions, but I will never forget. Um, we took a family trip to Disney World. I was in fifth grade and I had to be pushed in a stroller. They thought I had appendicitis and I went to the doctor before we left and 
thank God, just like the rest of my life, nothing ever shows up, you know, on a medical exam, but the pain that I felt and the discomfort that I felt for years was horrible. Um, and this lasted until I was living in Manhattan and I was around 23, 24 and the dizziness got out of control to the point that I had to hold on to things when I was walking. I couldn't, I, some days I missed work or I had to lay down in the middle. I felt like I was on a boat and again, you know, it was just physical symptoms. For some reason, I experienced physical debilitating symptoms for years. It was just- Jessica, can I interrupt you for one second, even before you continue? Sure. When you were younger and you felt that and you went to doctors and it wasn't appendicitis and it wasn't some irritable bowel or stomach issue. Did anyone say to you, hey, have you thought about seeing a therapist or maybe this is something that's, that's you know, psychological or you should explore anxiety in the in those days which is not that long ago i don't mean to to age you but did anyone even think to say it's not showing up physiologically maybe there's something psychological going on never i never went to a therapist and until today my mother feels tremendous guilt that she said if i only knew um but no they ended up we ended up going to a neurologist to test for dyslexia like we went all these medical routes but nothing psychological and i, I i'm the oldest of three girls and I was just that pain in the neck child that never felt well, that had to have my mother drive me around. I remember going to bat mitzvahs, having my mother drive me around the parking lot multiple times because I couldn't get out of the car. And it's not just because I didn't, I physically couldn't get my body out of the car. There's, it wasn't in my control. As much as I wanted to push, there's a lot of it that's just, it feels like it's out of your control. And we never, nobody ever said anything about any type of emotional distressors. Can you talk a little bit about that sensation of feeling trapped in your own body without having the language or the knowledge, frankly, around what that is, um, which is very different than a medical than medical symptomology because you could you could show an X-ray or you can print you know print a report. When it comes to something right. especially like anxiety, there is nothing to look at, and yet you're paralyzed in that seat of your mom's car. Right. Can you talk then, a little bit about that? In Nobody understood. I see a lot. I'm, I'm lucky that I kept a journal during those years because I was in so much really physical pain at that time. And I used to call it, there's like this monster inside of my head that's making me not feel well. And I can't figure out what it is. I, it's very hard to put words to it. I felt physically ill and nothing was showing up. And I went to, I had MRIs, I had x-rays. I went to doctors up in the boonies in New Hampshire and they put me on all sorts of natural medications nothing was working and I wasn't feeling well. And it just continued to get worse. When so, did it get, a, when did it get a name? How did it go so, from those physical symptoms to right. actually giving a diagnosis, giving it a name and then learning how to try to manage it? So when I was in my twenties and when I was first living in the city, I moved there. And again, I come from New Hampshire. So that in itself was a big move to come from Manchester, New Hampshire to Manhattan. Um, it was also the year that September 11th happened and my grandmother passed away. And um, one of my roommates said to me, Jess, I think you should go see a therapist. And I thought, she, I, I, I had no idea where that even came from. I thought she was out of her mind. But at that point I was so desperate to find relief somewhere that I said, okay. And it took two visits. She then sent me to a psychiatrist because I was complaining of such severe physical symptoms. And the psychiatrist diagnosed me with, at that point, it was general anxiety disorder. And he put me on medication. Um, and I would say that it decreased the symptoms by like 90%. Mm. Um, and, and then I forgot about it. I just kept moving my life. I was able to go to work. I was able to go to the gym. I was able to go out and socialize. And it kept me okay until five years ago. Before you get to the five years ago, when, when you were going through it, when it didn't have a name, yeah. and I know this might be a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's an important one. And, and again, I don't mean to pry. You'll, you'll share what you're comfortable. Did sure. anything give it relief? And did you consider? Because I know in, in Moshe's other area of expertise, and, and this will be a topic for another episode, but people who use drugs, alcohol, other things, substances that become addictions, mm -hmm. sometimes it's to numb oneself or to get relief from the pain of something like anxiety, was there anything that you ever did that was a distraction or that took away or that gave you that relief that you looked for so much um, even before it was diagnosed and you took medicine? At that time, those physical symptoms were so debilitating that I couldn't, I didn't even know how to look for relief. I was just, I mean, when I say debilitated, not able to get out of bed because I was spinning. 
So I wasn't, I didn't know what skills were. I didn't, you know, I wasn't really in therapy for talking about what was causing these symptoms. It was just take this medication, get the physical symptoms to go away and, and keep going with my regular life. I didn't want to continue exploring the therapy route. It was not something I was interested in that time. Um, so I, for myself, I just took the medication, medication. I felt better and I, I moved on. Well, can you tell Jessica, can you share a little bit about if, if, if you'd like, um, yes. a little bit about what, what that was like to, to function in society that know that you're on medication for, 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 you know, a mental health uh, disorder. Um, was right. there secrecy? Did you feel like you couldn't share that with others? What was that? Was it conflict for you? Can you talk a little bit about that? It's so interesting. I don't know why I don't have so much memory of that time. I, again, I think for me, I just wanted the relief. It wasn't, I wasn't questioning like, oh, I have an anxiety disorder. Anxiety happens to run in my family on both sides. So I knew that my grandmother constantly experienced panic attacks. I knew that my other grandmother experienced depression. So I knew that there was a genetic factor. I really wasn't asking questions and giving it too much thought. Again, I had just made a major life change moving. I was at the dating age. Like there was so much going on that I wasn't sitting and processing exactly what was happening. Did you share with friends or people close to you that you were taking medication? That's why you were feeling better. Or I guess that's what Moshe was getting at. Was there any shame around it that it's kind of like you take a medicine, don't tell anyone, thank God I now have relief and let's get back to life as normal. So at that time, no, but there really weren't any conversations happening then about anxiety. I don't even remember it being a word. I mean, this was already over 20 years ago. You know, I told my friend who sent me, I said, thank you so much. They prescribed medication and I'm hoping that it's going to work. And then when it started feeling better, they all noticed that I was, you know, coming to the Friday night dinners and going to the gym. But really, we weren't having any conversation about anxiety or mental health. Mm. It just was. So, so what five, years, five ago, years ago, take us through. Okay. Yeah. So five years ago, um, there was a, an, a certain event in my life that I didn't know affected me the way it did until Hatzalah was in my house almost every single day. And I was having panic attack after panic attack. I didn't know what that was until I called my first therapist from the ER. Um, this had gone on for two months. I, I was having such bad physical symptoms. I thought I was dying. I thought I was having a heart attack. So Hatzalah was on speed dial. Um, and then it got to a point when I started work that three days in a row, I just kept calling Hatsala and I said, this is ridiculous. There's something going on. I must go to the hospital. You know, every time they came and they checked my, um, I'm blanking on the word. Vitals. 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 Thank you. Everything was fine. You know, my heart rate was fine. My pulse was fine. Everything was fine. But I swore that something was wrong. Something wasn't okay. So I ended up going to the emergency room and they did all sorts of tests, EKGs and echocardiograms. And again, everything was fine. And one of the nurses came in and she said, have you ever struggled with anxiety? I said, yeah, I'm on medication. But why, if I'm on medication, why is it this bad? Anyways, a friend of mine gave me a therapist number and, and I called her from the hospital. And um, unfortunately, the physical symptoms kept climaxing to the point that the, the panic turned into severe depression. And this began a very, very negative spiral downwards. Um, I started losing tremendous amounts of weight. I never lost weight like this before. I mean, shedding pounds. I was not able to swallow. I wasn't able to eat. Um, I was having very, very unhealthy thoughts. Um, I struggled to not only to get up every day, but I needed a push to, to keep living. I really did. I think it's important that that people know that when, when someone's struggling with this, with any kind of thoughts of either harming themselves or suicidal ideation, that it's really not a joke. Even if somebody looks totally fine on the outside, which I did, I, most days I got up and I went to work. I still had gamach hours with, with over a hundred people walking through my doors. And yet the battle that was going on internally inside my own brain was capable of taking my own life. Mm. And, um, and I think the hardest part about these struggles is a, nobody can, not always, but at least for my situation, that they weren't visible to anybody else. And there was nowhere to go. There was just, yes, I started therapy and that was, you know, I started exposure therapy to panic. And then I started DBT therapy and really, for, I mean, financially also when you're struggling and, and you're not getting the right treatment, that's also a struggle. So I had to reach out to community members, really 
begging for my life, telling them I need help. I need help. Without the help, I'm not sure what's going to be. Um, but it's, it's, you know, therapy definitely helps with one part of this journey. And I think sometimes medication also does. But for me, and if I'm going too fast, you can, you know, jump in at any time. Um, through my journey, I was hospitalized twice and I spent a month in rehab. And it's really the skill that works for me is the power of connecting to others that are going through it. The ability to see with your own eyes that you're not alone. You know, we can listen to professionals night and day talk about how they're aware that this is an epidemic or a pandemic or an issue, but it's not the same as sitting side by side with someone that says, I get it. I live with it. I know what you're feeling. You really are not alone. Mm. What does that do? Can you, can you like just elaborate a little bit? You know, we know that group is a very powerful tool. Community is a powerful tool. And yet we're always with each other, right? Especially within our culture. Um, we just finished the yunt of season. And yet there are times that people feel profoundly alone. So can right. you talk a little bit about the advantages and what connection does to help you navigate this challenge? I, I want to just tell you a, a quick story of when I spent, I actually spent my 40th birthday in, in a psychiatric hospital and exercise for me is also a very big coping skill. So I started walking the halls. There's no other choice in, an, in a hospital, but I, my body needed that physical stimulation. And there was another woman there who I knew was from because of the way she dressed and she had a sitter in her hand a lot of the day. And so I tried, you know, she was very depressed. She really, she didn't have her clothes on and she wasn't moving. So even though I struggle with intense social anxiety, I needed something. I needed not the doctors, not the nurses. I needed more. So I went up to her and I asked her if she wanted to you know, walk with me. In the beginning, it was hard for her, but we ended up walking slowly around that floor together. And um, three days later, this woman was in her clothing. And I'll never forget, one of the African-American nurses came up to me and she said, Bobola, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. And it was that moment that my organization was born. It wasn't yet an organization, but I realized what was I doing? I was connecting to somebody else that was in pain. And that connection, it just, it, it literally knocks down the, isol the isolation that mental health brings with it. And it's the loneliness piece that I think often really drives people to dangerous places. Just feeling that you are alone. There's nowhere to, who am I calling at 11 o'clock at night? when I'm having these thoughts or I'm having a panic attack, you know, I always bring this up in conversation that people with, with an addiction, they can go to a meeting whenever they want night or day, they have the support they need. And there are those of us that are hiding either because of shame or stigma or because of lack of finances, but really because there's just nowhere to go. Where do we go? And that when you knock down that loneliness and isolation world of healing and change can take place. Um, it does for me, I've seen it happen in our groups. When I started my organization, I never thought we'd open a men's group. We have men coming to connect to each other. There's nothing like the power of, of connection when you, when you yourself are in pain. Let's let's come back to, cause connection, um, you know, we'll talk about some of the skill sets to manage cause you never really cure anxiety. You manage it the rest of your life and giving yeah. us some of those tips. And, and for those who are listening and watching for me, for us to learn, um, what works for you and what could work for others. But fast forward from the five years ago, two hospitalizations. And again, how, how are you doing today? How are you doing now? What is a typical day like today with anxiety? Has the therapy helped you, given you an outlet, the connections? We'll talk about what you're doing, but first just describe wh right. what the typical day is like today for you. So just like you said, you know, I, I remember when I first started therapy and they said, this isn't going to last forever. This is now five years, almost six years down the line. And I, I'm still in pretty intensive therapy and I have good days and I have bad days. I have days where, or weeks that I won't have a panic attack and the depression will feel like it's lifting. And then I can have a day or a week where I have multiple panic attacks and the depression is here and I'm, and I'm fighting, but because I've been in therapy and because I've started these groups, I do have the skills to get through. I don't deal with that isolation and loneliness that was really driving me to, you know, those places before. Um, there are skills, again, anybody that struggles, they have to find the skills that work for them. I think that's really um, an individualized thing. For me, it happens to be that exercising does help calm the anxiety down. Um, there are certain skills like 
Um, there's something called tip where you change your body temperature and you, for me, if I'm having a panic attack and I stick my face in an ice bucket of water, it acts as the dive reflex and it slows all your symptoms down. I find that very helpful. Something as simple as breathing. It's, you know, it really does help you get to a calmer place. Um, and so with all these, with all these managed, um, tools that you now have in your arsenal, do you yeah. live, do you live life, um, saying, you know, it could be that there'll come a point that I'm hospitalized again, or the next panic attack will come, but I know how to recover or bounce back. Or is there an ongoing maintenance that if I do all the right things and I take care of myself in the right way, hopefully that's in the rear view mirror and I won't ever have to be back in that place. So I don't want to convince myself that I'll never be back in that place because I think that's setting myself up, self up for, for excuse me, for failure. I really think a lot of this is about self-acceptance and realizing that this is an illness just like anything else. If you're in remission for cancer, can you say that the cancer will never come back? That's not a fair statement. Um, but with the proper support, you know, there are panic attacks that I have that I have to use medication for. There are panic attacks that I can either breathe through or reach out to a friend and I'll be able to get through it that way. I can reach out to my therapist. Sometimes those things work and sometimes they don't. All I know is that I try my best for whatever, whether it's anxiety or depression, I use whatever skills I can. And I try not to beat myself up when, you know, when I'm struggling a little bit more. But, but to say that I'll never end up in a hospital again, I just, you know, again, it's an illness. And I think it's important to accept that it's an illness and it's not something that you can just shake off and, and let it, you know, and it's going to go away. It, it's a part of who I am. And, and I've definitely gotten better and I definitely have a lot of work ahead. But um, it, it really is a journey. Jessica, you know, it sounds what you're saying is the awareness that this is your reality. It almost empowers you with the hope and the strength to be able to persevere through those various triggers and, and, yeah. and really confronting that awareness, not not staying in denial, which is obviously part of part of what we're doing here is to really bring this, um, you know, this message forward uh, to share it in real life with real, you know, with real people. Um, that if we can all maintain this conscious awareness that mental health and mental challenges exist, whatever the specific, it, you know, whatever the specifics are, um, right. that in, in, in its own right can, can empower somebody to persevere through. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, also if I'm in the middle of a severe panic attack and somebody calls telling me that they're struggling right away, I can switch into panic, into helping mode. And I think that, mm. As much as the awareness is, it's crucial. And I really think that we're, we're doing better at it. I think we need more. I really, you know, I, I think that each Jewish community needs to put their heads together and come up with a plan of not just awareness, but what can we do for these people? What in going to a psychiatric hospital is an extremely traumatic experience, especially as a Jewish, a Jewish from woman, you are, you are stripped away of your dignity. Your phone is taken away your clothing is taken away. Any, you, you, you have lost all access to any type of connection because you are struggling with your mental health. And if our communities could do something about that, just like there's a high lifeline, if you're going through cancer, you have where to turn. We can continue doing the awareness, but we need to come up with a plan of, of where we go. You know, we're doing what we can in our community. I have people reaching out to me from all over, from Brooklyn, from Canada, from Florida, from Cleveland. Do you have groups? And I, we don't. I, I'm one person. I, one person with anxiety and depression. I can't do it alone. But I really, with my whole heart, because I know how much connection saved my life, believe that we have to do more than awareness. So t talk to us more about suggestions for those connections, because... You know, just thinking and listening from the perspective of somebody who's not as familiar or aware or hasn't dealt with it, I think right. that you hear somebody's in a psychiatric hospital or going through that crisis, you kind of start moving away. Some people move away because they're worried it's contagious. Some people move away because they just don't understand it or can't begin to understand it. Some right. people move away because ridiculous reasons they're afraid for their kids should do them if they're connected to someone, whatever the, the reasons that are out there. And many, many really well-intentioned good people just move away because they don't know what to do. And they don't know, do I reach out to the husband? Do we do a meal? Is that weird that we know? Are they private? Are they embarrassed? Are they ashamed? Am I not supposed to know? So how could you speak to that with community? Again, you are incredibly courageous being here and I can't thank you enough. This conversation is so informative and inspiring to me and, and I'm sure it is to all the people watching and listening. But 
how can you speak to community at large? And what, and, and maybe every situation is different. Maybe there is a member of a family going through a situation that they want to remain private. They don't want the world reacting and helping and stepping up. And others say, yeah, I'm not embarrassed. I'm no more embarrassed than I would be had there been a physical diagnosis of a physical illness or malady. So what are some suggestions you have about very practically, how can the community um, work together, create a network, rally? What can it do to respond when situations arise? So I think that, you know, especially with the confidentiality piece, which is what, you know, a lot of people really want these these things confidential, and that has to be respected. Um, again, what I'm trying to do in my community is that people do reach out to me. And if just like any other illness, if they need meals, we will send meals. If they need help with their children, if there's a mother in the hospital and the father's trying to hold up the, the, the fort and go to work and has young children, they need help with their children. Um, just again, just if you literally could picture High Lifeline and what they do for those families, these families need exactly the same thing. And, and setting up support groups within the community so that people don't have to go through these challenges alone. They can walk through the door and be with others. Um, you know, it, it's, again, it, it's an illness. And just like if you're sick in bed, what are the things that you need? You need food. You need help with your kids. You need cleaning help. All of those situations are, are needed in, in people that are struggling with, with their mental health to a severe level. Just to follow up with, with the connections and a support group, because you're you're stimulating and motivating me to think about our community. So if, if we had a, a support group, let's say for anxiety or maybe a broader topic, but, but let's say right now anxiety, there'd be some members of the group who've been hospitalized, who've been diagnosed, who are on medications, who have panic attacks, who have severe anxiety disorder that they are managing through their lives. Right. You'll have other people who might just be going through, you know, Yontif's over, it was grueling, school's starting again, it's overwhelming, the winter's here, I'm getting depressed. And they're right. going to be in a group like that and say, I have anxiety because it's time to pack my kids for camp. And, and it's not diagnosed, it's not clinical. Is there a disparity? Does How do you so, feel about the people who all, use the word anxiety when they don't really have diagnosed? Right. For, we're, for, with our groups, there's definitely, there's an intake process that takes place. There's a licensed mental health professional that's doing the intakes and everybody has to fill out confidentiality forms. Not everyone is ready for one of our support groups. They're not meant for people in a crisis situation. After somebody comes back from the hospital, I mean, again, that's rare. I would say in our groups, maybe there are two, and we have, we are starting our fifth group. Maybe there are two people that are really at that level that have need hospitalization. Um, the beauty of these groups, and it's also something that I saw in rehab, is that nothing really matters. Age doesn't matter. Um, gender doesn't matter. How wealthy you are doesn't matter. How much you struggle doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're in that room because you want to openly talk about your struggles, whether they are challenging yuntif experiences or you know situations that are happening in a marriage. There is no judgment. Nobody's judged for the severity of you know their anxiety or depression. Um, so it really, again, these groups are not meant for crisis situations, but they have varying, you know, people struggling with varying levels of both anxiety and depression. You have other suggestions of things that, that community leaders, shuls could be doing around mental health in general? I think I really, you know, even if they each shul lets the community know that they're there for them. And this is the number. If you need help, here is the number. We are here for you if you need, you know, to really just instead of saying awareness, awareness, really be specific. If you're struggling with your mental health, obviously, like you said, there's a difference between just being anxious to debilitating anxiety and depression. There's, you know, we all need help, but there are different levels of, of help that somebody needs. But to let the community know that even if they're struggling with, with a mental health related issue, they can still get meals and, and care for their children and direction for therapy and Really, if I'm telling you, there's nothing more healing than these support groups. So I believe with my whole heart that every community should work on, you know, getting this off the ground. It, it does become a little bit of a, a financial struggle because they are run by licensed mental health professionals. We don't follow the AA model because we're dealing with mental health and, you know, you, you do have to be careful. Um, but those are those are practical ways, connection and all the practical, you know, food, child care, cleaning help just like anybody else gets when they're struggling. Incredible. Wow, how, very, how, uh, very powerful. Thank yeah. you.
Thank you. Can, I, can you add anything about any message about about family, the role of, of family when a member of the family is going through something and, and maybe they handle it differently. Maybe maybe the person going through it is fully transparent and, and not ashamed, but maybe family members are struggling more with that. What's the role of family in this process? So we actually have a support group for women whose husbands are struggling. And we were just reached out by a few men to see if we have groups for men for what uh, that have wives that are struggling. So again, I think the support is important. Um, Again, this is where an organization comes into play. You know, he's, I, I actually went to a husband reached out to me to see if I could go visit his wife in the hospital. And without question, you know, I did. And it was a life changing experience. And we actually got her into a rehab program. But it's they, there's nowhere to reach out. They, people do need guidance, just like people need guidance with cancer. Which doctor do I go to? What do I what do I do to help? I am not a professional. I am more than happy to be a listening ear to anybody that calls me. But people that are, you know, family members that are, they're lost. They also don't know what to do. You know, they don't know how to help their loved one that's struggling. They don't know how to, to, you know, balance the family by themselves. It's really, really hard. It's almost harder, I think, for the spouse who feels so helpless and lost and alone that, you know, it becomes debilitating for them. They just don't know what to do. So I think it's, a, again, that's where these groups come in, talking yeah. to other people are going through it and, and gain, you know, how, how are you handling this? And okay, maybe I can incorporate that into my life because it's, it's different than talking to a professional. A professional can give their advice and opinion, but when you're talking to people that are going through it, three husbands are sitting there whose wives are, you know, in, in a facility or possibly going to a facility, they can sit and brainstorm together. There's right. nothing more powerful. There's, and there's no question. I mean, we see it, you know, on addiction treatment side, we call it a family disease. And there's, you know, the, the, the case breakdown is we look at not only the individual struggling with addiction, but we look at all the systemic pieces. And, and as we build, rebuild the puzzle for this family, it's about, you know, the Al-Anon and the, you know, family work that dovetails so beautifully into the individual struggling. And that could be used perhaps as a model for, any mental health issue, uh, anxiety is so the co, there's the co, the, you know, the, the spouse or the family member. Of. And that's really the truth because family, we are so, you know, we are, we don't exist in an Island. We are part of the family. We are, you know, we, we support each other through the good times and through the challenging times. So Jessica, your point is, is so valid to look at the individual, but really look at the entire system at the family unit or at the community unit. Um, and, and to really, look at that as not just as an individual struggling and the conversations, I think, you know, to, to, to our point that way we speak about to, to not only have the conversation around the individual struggling with anxiety, but about the individuals struggling with an individual who's struggling with anxiety and, and how that can really on, you know, we, where people can just pop in and get the support that they need when their spouse is struggling. It's, I don't know how to do it alone, but it's something that has to be created in the world of mental health, because just like AA and Al-Anon saves lives, this can save lives too. We are losing people yeah. um, that, you know, that we don't even know about, or it's not spoken about, but the more people I speak to, and, and I was told that, you know, the cause of, of, of death, there are suicides happening in our neighborhoods and we're not talking about it and nobody wants to know about it. And we can save these people by putting mm -hmm. systems into place. So close this out, Jessica. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your leadership. First of all, tell us the name of the organization and how people could be in touch. But, but my final question our final question is, you have a lot of courage and, and it seems like you don't have shame at this point of, of your managing and tackling your anxiety. Um, and, and, and you're having a conversation with us like you had asthma or diabetes or, or you broke your arm and, and that's how you're viewing this, not your fault and without guilt as a genetic component or whatever the reason. But there's people watching and listening who are embarrassed, they're ashamed, they're hiding in the shadows, they're not getting treatment they need, or they're not telling anyone about it, they're not coming to ask where they can connect with others, and they're living with a lot of shame. What would your message be to them? How did you get to this point where you don't see it as something that's your fault, that you're willing to be courageously transparent, that you're so devoted to help others? And what would be your message to somebody who's not there yet, who's reluctant, hesitant, ashamed, embarrassed, and who's, who's trying to, to hide it underneath the uh, under the covers? Um, it's not easy. I think that, you know, the shame and stigma is a, is a very big piece. I think it's, I think it's even a bigger piece because we're afraid of, of the generations underneath us. I think that's where a lot of the shame and stigma is coming from. Um, and it's crucial to really understand and accept that this isn't something in our control. 
it is an illness. It's just like you said, like asthma or diabetes. That's what this is. Why it has so much shame and stigma, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I always tell people, I don't know what I would have, where I would have been if I didn't get help. And you, you, most of us that struggle are really amazing people. We're very in tuned emotionally. We're highly driven people and, and we struggle and it's a sickness and the sickness needs help. And when you get help, you will be a better person for it. You will be a better individual. You will be a better mother, friend, spouse, community member. That's what all of this healing is about. And there is nothing to be ashamed or, you know, ashamed about. And, and the stigma really needs to be knocked down because it is a sickness. It is, it is completely out of our control. And that's what we just have to keep telling ourselves. What's the name of the organization? How can people find it? It's called Catch Support. It's www.catchsupport.org. Um, my email and, and phone number are on there. People are more than welcome to text, email, pick up the phone. And in the Farakaway Five Towns community, we're more than welcome, more than willing to welcome them into our family. And we hope that we can create these mini families in, in communities around the United States and the world. We can't thank you enough for the for the courage and for being so open with us. Thank you so much for having thank me. You. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much for taking of your busy schedule to join us and, and help contribute to this conversation on anxiety. There's nobody better than, than somebody who is founded and running a center for anxiety to give us some insight and some skills and, and really for people, whether it's clinical diagnosed anxiety, for people who just feel anxious through their day and maybe not rising sure. to that level, but it's hard to believe that anyone today or any home today doesn't have someone in it who is not confronting anxiety, which maybe is our, our best first question. Can you talk to us a little bit about what, what are you seeing in terms of the prevalence of anxiety? The general population is the Jewish community or the religious Jewish community more prone to anxiety than the general population? Did the pandemic expedite or elevate the levels sure. of anxiety that we're all feeling? You know, Rather than anxiety being some diagnosis that's just out there for outliers, how much does it really reflect what's happening in the general population today? Yeah, I will tell you that things are very busy. Um, having a Center for Anxiety has been uh, just unbelievable. The last year, the last two years, even the last three years building up to the pandemic, but certainly since uh, uh, March 2020, um, anxiety, stress, uh, and all of its cousins are very much on the rise um, and being felt in, I would say, every corner. Um, even if it's not at the, what we'd say, clinical level, as you alluded to, uh, Rabbi Goldberg, with uh, people who are significantly distressed or impaired, I think everybody today is impacted by anxiety and stress uh, to some degree. And um, having strategies and tools to be able to deal with that is, uh, is just part of living in the modern day. Do you think that the Jewish community in particular or the observant Torah community because of religious requirements, standards, expectations, does yes. all of that promote more anxiety? It's a good question and it's one that I get a lot. My research has not shown any uh, demonstrable differences in terms of anxiety among Orthodox versus non-Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jews versus individuals outside of the population. Um, and in fact, one of the interesting findings recently that we, we had is that Orthodox Jews are also not less likely to seek treatment. We're not less likely to use medications or to use psychotherapy. Um, my data has shown that together with Dr. Uh, Steve Puritinsky at Turo um, University, um, we've, we've published on this extensively. In fact, one really interesting finding is that it seems that Orthodox Jews come in with lower levels of anxiety relative to the population, which shows a higher degree of sensitivity and more of a need and desire to work on our mental health and our emotional mm -hmm. well-being, which I think is actually very optimistic and, and a positive finding. And we've been able to replicate that in a couple of samples. Well, would you say that, what are some of the primary contributing factors to that? Because that's a phenomenal you know, data point there. Uh, is it our family systems? Is it the spirituality that we incorporate into our lives? What would you say or something else that uh, you know, is a contributing factor to maybe you know, beating the larger population when it comes to mental health, specifically anxiety? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And it does go a little beyond the data I have, but if I had to venture a guess, I'd say there are a couple of converging factors. Number one, um, uh, Orthodox Jews tend to have larger families. So when you have four, five, six, 10, 12 kids and one or two of them are more are anxious, that could impact the others. And it could also impact the parents. And we're very family centric. You're not talking about two parents and a kid and a dog. That's, it happens, but it's more rare in the Orthodox community. So because we're so family centric and we tend to have larger families, when people have even lower or middle levels of anxiety, we wanna to tend to it before it becomes out of hand. Because if it gets out of hand, God help you. So that's one. Another one is potentially our historic focus on Musar and in Hasidus even, and focusing on uh, Pneumius that they, as they say, and uh, internal workings and our, you know, building our character. Not that these are characterological issues, but at the same time, emotional, behavioral, and virtues and character are, are related to each other. And I think that there could be a greater interest in psychotherapy and working on oneself, which is consistent with our uh, spirit, general spiritual framework of of growth. That is very optimistic. So for the, for those who either are diagnosed or see themselves as, as struggling with it, what what would you say are, are some of the causes of anxiety? Is this is this something which is uh, nature or nurture? Are people born predisposed? Is it genetic? Is it chemical? Or are there other factors that happen, trauma in people's lives, something like a pandemic? Are there other factors that can bring out anxiety? Fantastic question. Um, the number one factor that drives anxiety that I've seen in the literature repeated over and over again, in multiple studies, not my own, although some of my own, but mostly in general, the conferences that I go to, all the academics, the, the scholars who I who we speak with, is a very simple factor, which is intolerance of uncertainty. If you can't stand not knowing what's gonna happen next, you are going to be anxious. It is really that simple. And in the last couple of years, people's tolerance for uncertainty plummeted. We were on edge trying to know what's happening next. What are gonna be the, you know, what are the numbers today? What are the numbers tomorrow? When are we going back to school? We weren't able to simply accept that we are not in control and that uncertainty is part of the human condition. So the more we have intolerance of uncertainty, the more anxious we are going to be. And it's almost math in many cases. Um, and treatment, by the way, is about learning to tolerate and accept that we are not in control, that things happen that are just going to come out of left field and learning to have equanimity and, and deal with that. Um, which, is, which is really that's the nutshell. <laughs> We're so excited to have you on because not only do you have the, you know, the clinical experience of working with clients, managing, helping them manage their anxiety, but you also have, have dipped into the academic world and really have at the cutting edge of, of the research and the current Thank research. You. So um, can you talk a little bit more on the clinical level uh, regarding sure. some tools that you've seen? Is it just a simple acknowledgement of what's causing the anxiety or are there some practical sure. uh, take home skills that people can can maybe adapt without going to therapy or is that always required? Just a general. I just want to tag on before you answer it also, because I'm curious okay. based on what you just said about that the treatment is, is a willingness to live with uncertainty. What role does faith have in it? You know, whenever I give class a shiram on Amuna and, and I address notions of how that can help us with our anxiousness, I'm always careful to say, this is not the solution. If you need to see a doctor, if you need to take a medicine, if you need therapy, yes. you know, I'm not here saying just, you, it's a flaw in your Amuna. If you have Amuna, faith in Hashem, all will be okay. But I'm curious, if it does play a role with everything else that Moshe asked, is, does, is, is faith an important ingredient to grow in, in learning to live with the uncertainty and manage the anxiety? These are great questions, and I'll try to answer sort of all of them in, 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 one, in one shot. Um, all human beings are on a continuum when it comes to anxiety. Some of us are flourishing, but we're still a little stressed and anxious. I would say that's the best you can be today. Um, others of us are languishing. We're not flourishing, we're struggling, but we're not clinically distressed with anxiety and with you know, significant symptoms. A little further down, people are distressed. They actually need some sort of professional support in order to get through. And then on the far end of the continuum are folks who are severely distressed, who might need a hospital setting or something more invasive, whether it's out in intensive outpatient or residential treatment or, or something like this. Now at all of those levels of the continuum, whether it's flourishing, languishing, distressed, or severely distressed, the main point is to learn to tolerate uncertainty better. However, if you're severely distressed and you're just going to, even if it's a geschmack a even if it's a wonderful class, 
on Amuna, on faith, on Vitacha, on, on trusting in, in something greater, and you're learning to tolerate using only spiritual approaches, I agree with you, Rabbi Goldberg, that that's probably not going to be enough. They probably need multimodal treatments, which might include pharmacology for that matter, in order to take things down a notch, to learn to tolerate it better, to practice this in one's daily life, to engage with family members you know, around these things, to have similar messages coming from different angles. People might need more comprehensive care, but certainly for people who are flourishing and even languishing, I mean, you know, chizuk and amuna, as they say, giving people strength and, and supporting their faith. I think uh, uh, clergy, people in clergy have a huge job to do today and uh, really across the board, but certainly for, uh, especially for those people in those echelons. Hmm. Good. And, and how do, what are some tools to incorporate spirituality, faith, trust, um, or is it the knowledge that there's a power beyond us that is in control? Um, you know, how, how does it practice? How does that, that's a, a theoretical, theoretical framework, but how does that on a practical level? Um, sure. You know, in the well, office depends, or in the conversation? It depends on the level. Do you mean with patients, like at, at the distressed or severe distress level or people who are more flourishing and languishing and outside of a clinical context? Maybe I would say outside the clinical level first. And then sure. and then maybe, you know, if there's one or two examples from some of the more, you know, intense cases of, of where anxiety has paralyzed their, their life. Absolutely. For individuals who are flourishing or languishing today, um, they still need to be going to classes on the MUNA to be, I would say, if somebody has a background, a yeshiva background, um, or a Beis Yaakov background, they've been, they've been studying, they understand Hebrew, they can read. Um, the Chovos Alavavos, the Duties of the Heart, is a section called uh, Shar HaBitachon, the section of, of trust in God. It's been a go-to uh, uh, for helping people to strengthen their faith and, frankly, to deal with anxiety for over a thousand years. So you can't do better than that in terms of history and in terms of, uh, you know, a spiritual technology. Um, but there are also there are classes about the subject, whether it's on Torah anytime or whether it's, uh, you know, any number of classes. I'm sure, Rabbi Goldberg, you have plenty of resources there that I'm not even aware of. Um, also, I'll add speaking to mentors about this matter, having uh, having a, a rabbinic or, or, or a rebbitzin, having somebody who you can talk to about matters of faith, clarifying these things, um, having conversations at, uh, at the Shabbos table about that, um, looking at Debray Torah about that, giving it over, speaking to one's family. All of these are, are it's not just spirituality to these days, it's, it's to some degree it's medicine. <laughs> and, mm. and I mean it like that. Um, at, the, at, the, at the more uh, distressed and severe uh, levels, we, we would usually, I would conceptualize um, spiritual and religious resources like we're speaking about as complementary. So um, I love collaborating with clergy in my cases that, that we deal with. This week, I think we had two or three, two, two clergy collaborations, um, just individuals. So I'm speaking to their spiritual mentors, making sure that the same messages are coming in from both the spiritual and a mental health angle. Um, there's also a chaplaincy, you know, at our uh, at McLean Hospital where I work and do my research. We have a robust chaplaincy program and uh, chaplains can make a massive difference for people at severe levels of distress. Um, spiritual visitation, family support, you know, all of these things are part and part of, uh, I would say, medical practice today when it comes to anxiety. Um, it just depends on what you need and, and how you get it. You've, you've written extensively about anxiety, not only not having to debilitate or paralyze a person's life, but the notion of thriving with anxiety to actually turn yes. the anxiety into a strength. And I think it's really sure. important for the people watching and listening, whether they rise to the, the clinical level or or that you know the person struggling, or like you said, they're they're thriving or floundering, but feel still anxious. To know that not only can you manage it or so to say overcome it, you can actually turn it into a strength. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. What I'm what I've found now, looking back over having done this for a better part of twenty years, is that so many of my patients who I thought at the time and they thought at the time were debilitated. I mean, they were debilitated and really struggling with their anxiety. Now, many years later looking at their lives, I've seen how much of a blessing it actually was that they were anxious in the first place, because I'll give you an example. Going into the pandemic, I was frankly terrified. Here I have an anxiety clinic with over a thousand active cases and people are out of school and stress is going through the roof. We don't even know what's gonna be, are my patients gonna be at higher risk for suicide? Like what's gonna happen here? Within three or four months of the pandemic starting, I was so relieved and surprised 
and many of my patients, and sometimes the most challenging ones, were actually doing the best in the pandemic. And many people who had done perfectly fine beforehand were coming in for mental health services for the first time, and they were doing far worse than people who had been in therapy for years because they weren't prepared. They didn't understand the importance of tolerating uncertainty. And all of a sudden, uncertainty hit, and they didn't know what to do. So in many cases, um, learning to deal with anxiety becomes a tremendous strength and an ability to, to create and generates resilience for the rest mm. of one's life. It's such a powerful message because it's even something that, you know, we talk all the time around being proactive when it comes to mental health and, and, and clinical challenges. And this is such a great way to be proactive, to, you know, proactively work on faith and, you know, and, and manage sure. the, a life within uncertainty. And there's so many things about our, our worlds that are uncertain. And if a person and our children and our family systems can really discuss the reality that we're living in an uncertain world. And there's so many things about life that's uncertain, uh, whether it's medicine, finance, um, social development, et cetera, across the board, um, proactively building that, that skill base and the tolerance uh, can, can sure. help mitigate uh, the potential person, even if there's a predisposition to anxiety. Is that what you're saying? A hundred percent. I have a meditation of sorts that I do every time I get on a plane that I'm stepping onto an aluminum box and it's going to be traveling at hundreds of miles an hour, tens of thousands of feet above the earth. And I have no control. And I don't know whether I'm going to land. I don't even know what city I'm going to end up in. I think, I mean, the board says I'm going to wherever Detroit. So that's where I'm heading. But like, I don't know. There are diversions. There's all sorts of stuff that happens in midair before you get off the plane. And I, you just got to accept it. When I sit in my seat and I buckle my seatbelt, I'm like, I'm, I'm off duty. And that's great. And learning to thrive with it and tolerate it has been, it's been a boon for me and um, hopefully for others. I'm, I'm finding this incredibly um, empowering and practical. First of all, you know, Eitan, who's, who's one of the people we interview on our, on this episode about anxiety, shares with that, um, because he struggled with anxiety, he learned to live with uncertainty. And when he was Fantastic. in college, when a professor announced a, a, a test that caught classmates off guard and they panicked, he was like, that's what you're panicked about? Like, that's nothing. Like, I know how to deal with uncertainty. And basically, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but sure. you're saying that resiliency is essentially a muscle. And when you work it out, it grows stronger. And then it's ready to be able to face the resistance to it. So even somebody who doesn't think they have anxiety, the more we work out that resiliency muscle, with our families, with our children, with ourselves, when inevitably, invariably, everybody faces some uncertainty, God forbid, a diagnosis, something in life yes. like a pandemic, which is, yeah. affects us all equally, then the stronger that muscle will be, the, the more ready it is when that resistance comes. That's 100%. That's what it's all about. Is there an age that you would recommend starting this process, uh, whether it's uh, you know elementary school, high school, junior high school? Is there any type of maybe when a, a person is married, what would you, what, is there any research one way or the other? I don't have research, but I've got a funny story. There was a couple that went to Shlomo Volda and said they, she, she was pregnant, that they were pregnant, they were expecting. And uh, they said, uh, you know, what can we do for, for our baby? And he said, it's too late. <laughs> he was joking, of course, <laughs> but uh, what should we pray for our baby or something like that? He, he, he was joking, it was too late. And I, the point was obviously not that it's too late, but the point is that you can't, you can never start too early. Too In early. utero is perfectly, perfectly on target. <laughs> do you have a, do you have a suggestion more for, um, you know, I, I read research that we, the conversations in our own head, we speak up to 4 million words a day in our own head in the conversation with ourselves, right? And even if that's off by, you know, 100%, it's by 50%. <laughs> it's an enormous amount of words, the conversation's ongoing. And it seems to me that anxiety and those feelings of anxiousness are about things we're telling ourselves. So a person might listen to this podcast, could be reading uh, your writings and others, and be told all the right things to think. But in that moment, where their brain goes into fight or flight, or they're living with fear, or they feel weak, and the conversation, the story they're telling themselves is one that brings them down. Yeah. How do you intervene and stop it? How do you press pause? How yeah. do you get that thinking back? Is there any practical strategy you can give us? Yes, I'll tell you exactly. The, the number one factor that I've seen that perpetuates anxiety in the moment is a, a perceived need to stop anxiety from happening. When I feel anxious and I want to stop myself from feeling anxious, that move in my mind 
is exactly what perpetuates it further. And mm. the reason why is because when I feel anxious, my fight or flight system, as you mentioned, is kicking into gear. That means that adrenaline is seeping into my bloodstream and it's moving out throughout my body. Now, if I fight against it, what happens to my level of adrenaline? It goes up. So the only option right then is literally to accept uncertainty in the moment. Dealing with acute anxiety is actually a practice of letting go and not fighting it. I'm going to accept that however long I'm going to feel anxious for, however long I'm going to feel uncomfortable, that's how long it will be. And I am not going to fight this. And the minute we let go and we say, okay, I'm panicking. I'm going to let it wash over me. Panic, you win. Take like whatever you want, like however long you want to stay, that's what's going to be. That is an act of acceptance in of itself, which eventually, which helps things to settle down quicker than they otherwise would. That's a great tip. That's a great strategy. Yeah, in a clinic, we usually use that in a clinical setting, but that could definitely has implications for people who are flourishing or languishing if they're having a, a surge of anxiety on a, a given day. Can you give us a, a window into that? What, what would a dialogue look like between somebody who's struggling with anxiety and that therapist um, regarding, you know, sure. the individual? I had one the other day. I had one the other day. In fact, it's on my phone. I'm going to see if I can pop it up. I had an exchange with my patient about it. She was very concerned about her. She has hypogondriasis and she was very, very concerned. Oh no, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I have a rule that if people ask me for assurance once, I'll give it to them. I'll say, you're probably fine. If they ask it for again, I'll ignore it. And the third time they're going to get some humor. So she said to me, my neck, my neck. So I said, you're probably dying. So she says like, you know, don't, you know, don't say that. I'm like, you know, <laughs> giving her like giving her an emoji for, and she knew exactly what I was trying to do. Um, and then later on in the day, I wrote to her, are you dead yet? And she writes back, yes. So I said, cool. <laughs> I saw her later in the day. She wasn't anxious. Mm-hmm. Now, now, it's, first of all, it's amazing that you're an authority on anxiety and you said that. I feel like a rabbi who had that exchange would like be thrown out of his pulpit, <laughs> would be canceled by the world. But but you're saying that there's there's room to allow for humor even in this sure. healing. Now, I wouldn't make I'm not making fun of my patients and they know it and it's done right. in a good jest and of course it's with mm-hmm. a lot of validation and and a, a lot of a lot of you know you have to have that relationship there in order to pull those kind of that kind of shtick. Um, but uh, you know this patient she knows that I that I care about her and. Uh, I wasn't making fun. So I have to ask you a question. If you're, you know, if part of the the solution is to really kind of lean into that anxiety, into into the unknown and embrace it. Yes. Um, yes. How does, what's the flip side towards validating that this fear or the perception of the fear is real? And my, my thinking is is on point and I, I have the self to express. Um, if a child comes over to, to, an, to a parent and, and expresses something they're concerned about or anxious, how do you practically, on one hand, the need to validate the child's feeling, on the other hand, uh, encourage them to lean into the fact that it's that we don't know the answer? How do you balance that? So with kids, it's a little tricky because sometimes you don't want to, you know, you, you want to uh, show them uh, that the world is a safe place and they might be getting out of hand. So, so there's there's a couple of qualifying factors that, that unfortunately we don't have time to quite talk about. But with regards to validation in general, um, to me, the fact that life is uncertain is the reason to validate. I really don't know what's going to happen next. I, I, in some ways, I wish I did, although in other ways, I'm glad I don't know what's going to happen next. It keeps things interesting, right? So um, I think that that does make it valid. I, mm-hmm. I really, if somebody comes in and they're consumed with worry, you know, Taka, as they say, like, yeah, of course you're worried. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. And you're tapped into it in a better way than other people. Can you learn to live with it and to thrive with it? in a way that'll make you more resilient for the future. That's the way I would probably spend the conversation. So I'm not trying to silence that voice. We're trying to learn to live with that voice. Oh yeah. One, one last question. We thank you so much for your time. The last question you you've used several times, the different categories of thriving, languishing, or in crisis. How does someone know which category they're in? Someone who has anxious thoughts, how do they know if they have like, you know, I joke and I could get canceled for it, but the normal Jewish neuroticism, anxiousness, worry, or how do they know that it rises to another level that it needs to be addressed more significantly? How does someone know which category they're in? Yeah, it, it's, it is a, it is a game time decision, as they say. 
Um, but, uh, you know, if things are going well in your life, if you're uh, able to work, if you're able to function well, your relationships are going well, it's not impacting you, you're probably in the either flourishing or languishing category. If it's starting to impact your functioning, if it's starting to be something you carry around with you, what we say most of the day, nearly every day, even if you're functioning well, but it's, it's on your mind most of the day, that, that's already something in clinical territory and something we have to, we have to address. Um, I think that'll at least bifurcate it in terms of, you know, A, A B or C, D um, to give you a little direction. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your incredible Fantastic. work. Thank you for the time you've given Thank us. You. Thanks really for having me. Really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Tom, we're so grateful that you're joining us. Thank you so much for the, the courage to be willing to uh, put a face and a name and a story to this conversation, which is so relevant to so many people. We know that they will derive tremendous chizik strength from you sharing that story. And so we're we're so appreciative of your being here. Yeah. Of course. I Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me. And Anytime your people. courage, honesty really serves as a model for so many people and uh, helps them perhaps find the voice so we're excited and uh, we appreciate ahead of time your courage and willingness to to share. So get us get us started with a little bit about about you, about where you're at in life, about how you got there and then and then we'll get into anxiety. Okay, sure. Uh yeah, just a little bit about me. I'm from Chicago uh initially. Um I came to New York about 9 years ago uh, to study at uh, Yeshiva University. It's a a uh, small college in uptown New York. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, so, and uh, and from there, uh, at YU, from there at YU, I got a job uh, in New York uh, after school in uh, in accounting. Um, got my CPA shortly after, and I've actually uh, been at the uh, same place since graduating. So it's been about uh, six years now. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, in terms of it's been great being in New York. I'm in. I'm on the Bronx side now, and um, and yeah, it's been great at working here. Um, I'm in a managerial role at the accounting firm now, so it's. I mean, it's frankly, been it's a really exciting, uh, uh, fast rising uh, career trajectory to start off. Fantastic. So take us back in your life to when you first started sensing that that you had were having some feelings of anxiety, of anxiousness. Did, did you know their name or were they just feelings? Were they, uh, how, how did you know something was off and what age were you? And how did you go through the process of, of even learning that, that there was anxiety and what you could do about it? So I started with my anxiety symptoms. Uh, I would estimate about the time I was at 10. Uh, at that point, I didn't realize that uh, something was uh, going on with me that I was maybe having unnatural uh, anxious thoughts or, uh, or depressive uh, thoughts, and uh, I mean, long story short, they went uh, pretty much unchecked for uh, nearly uh, a decade before I started addressing them. Um, when I when it started, uh, about the time I was ten, and a long time after that, I didn't even realize anything. Anything was off. No terms. No nothing. I maybe I attributed, you know, something to being. Maybe I thought I was a negative person or feelings of puberty. Or whatever it was, but I definitely didn't think anything was off. Um, how, did it, how did it manifest itself? What was different at ten years old? Uh, so go, going back to it, um, you know, there were uh, you know things which um, you know a lot of people would barely notice, which like genuinely had me shaking. Uh, thinking back at it, such as a a car going by fast or a door slamming. Some people would barely notice that, maybe like catch their attention, but like things like that would uh, like have me shaking. And that's you know, a, more of like a generalized anxiety. And then there are also examples of social anxiety, which you know manifested over uh, over time. Um, and things uh, with the social anxiety, I, uh, like specific memories, like things like if I heard someone snickering, I assumed just assumed that someone was snickering, even a total stranger. I assumed they were laughing at, at at me. Maybe it was about the way I was dressed. I was dressed perfectly normally, uh, but that's what I assumed. Uh, I, I remember walking through my high school hallways uh, with my head down, just praying not to bump into someone because I assumed that person uh, wouldn't want to uh, to see me. 
Uh, so that was over time some of those uh, signs in terms of how I realized that you know something was off and this just wasn't just you know normal ways of thinking is when I started to break through a little bit in my mid teens and started to have you know some some good and some more normal thinking mixed in. I, you know, something good to compare the bad to, I realized that the bad was not natural thinking patterns. Oh, um, what'd you do about that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, basically not much uh, for a while. I uh, had all sorts of, you know, maybe, you know, just frankly nonsensical, you know, thoughts about what was going on with my head. I compared it to like a, you know, kind of like a baseball hitter who's on a hot streak or a cold streak sometimes. It's like, maybe if I tune the radio just this way, you know, this channel, I'll try this channel on my way to school, things will be better. Um, but it really wasn't until uh, my late teens, uh, when I, I got so fed up with what had been going on now for the past many years, uh, that I went to a computer and I started uh, Googling um, uh, just whatever I could uh, think of. And then I, I stumbled upon the word uh, generalized anxiety and the definition of it. And I remember uh, I, uh, I would compare it to like at the end of the movie, the sixth, uh, sense. Oh, and Bruce Real Willis realized he'd been a ghost for the past several years. Uh, I literally fell backwards, uh, stunned. I, I, I know I just ruined that movie, but I feel like what, like two decades, that's enough of a grace period. So to watch it, <laughs> but that's, that's what I felt like. So at that point in time, uh, actually pretty quickly after that, I did the hardest thing I've, uh, I think I've ever done, which is, uh, tell tell a friend uh, what I had it felt like I'd been feeling for the past many years. Uh, and then shortly after that, I started therapy treatment with uh, medication as a helper. And relatively quickly, I got the stuff sorted out, which had been plaguing me for about a decade. And I'm so thankful for the great health uh, that I've had since then. Hey, Tom, can you talk a little bit about when you were maybe in, you know, elementary school, really towards the end, junior high school and high school, um, the feeling you had regarding noticing that something was off, um, perhaps it was in your mind and comparing it to your friends and what would be considered healthy development, um, not being, you know, feeling comfortable to share with family members or with friends who finally did break the ice. What was that like to be locked in that space uh, for so long while you were through that? Yeah. So, you know, I could be in an auditorium full of hundreds of people and still feel so, so like terribly alone uh, at the at the same time. I felt like, especially once I realized that, you know, there there is something going on with me. I felt like I was the only person uh, mm -hmm. going through this, that it wasn't worth talking to somebody because even if I could explain what was going on to somebody, it definitely wasn't curable uh, or helpable or fixable, whatever you want to call it. Um, because there, there was frankly uh, no uh, sort of, discussion or education about that. I mean, think about it. How wild is, is that story? Uh, for, for Throughout my teen, year, teen years, uh, I was held back from feeling uh, at my best, and it probably didn't have to be if there would have been some sort of education, uh, you know, somewhere in, in my life about, uh, you know, what mental health feelings had to be. And I'm not blaming, uh, you know, whatever schools or communities or whatever. It, it, it wasn't specific to me. It was specific to it's, it was certainly at that time specific to everywhere. This stuff just wasn't uh, talked about. And it's, I, I just think it's just, it's just wild. It could have been addressed maybe when I was 10 or 11. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that we have a you know, podcast like this now and people are talking about it. Schools are talking about it. It's such uh, an important point you're making. So you're saying when you were going through those years, um, middle school, high school, had there been some, some teachers, some assemblies, some literature, some comment and you would have said, yeah, that that's it. That's how I feel. That's what's going on. Who can I talk to more about this? You mean I don't have to feel this way? It could have changed your life radically at that time. Again, not blaming anyone. Yeah. We didn't know as much as, as we know now. But even for now, for schools, for communities, for yeshivas, for seminaries, for it, it's so critically important um, to not have stigma and shame around it, to talk about it and to invite the people who may relate to it. I want before before we head into that, I want to ask you a different question. When you were in those years and you were feeling so alone, even in a crowded room, and, and you, you could either be personal, don't feel obligated to be personal, you could speak in generality. Were you tempted to turn to anything to numb you to that? Did anything give you relief from that? So to be awake was to feel lonely and to feel anxious and to feel self-conscious. So did anything give you relief from that? Did anything numb you to that? 
Were you tempted to try to do things that would give you relief from that? Yeah. Uh, so thank God I personally wasn't. Um, I, I benefited from what I think is just a tremendous uh, natural resiliency and then the resiliency, which working through mental health challenges, I think gives anybody. So I've had that benefit and I've always been, um, you know, very, uh, a- academically or, uh, driven and or athletically driven or whatever extracurriculars. So, uh, fortunately, um, I, uh, I, 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 I wasn't at that, never got to a point where I was thinking of, of, of doing something, uh, which would be and almost, possible. almost because behaviorally things didn't escalate. You know, no one around you noticed anything or could observe that there was anything going on, and and which is part of you know the power and and the the fear around anxiety, where it's there's nothing external that that looks array. There's nothing that you're not you don't have a cast. You know, you're not yeah. walking with a limp. It's uh, you know you look like a regular normal kid going through junior high school or high school, and yet there's this paralyzing feeling that's dominating every aspect of your interactions with others and your thinking. Um, and, and that is truly suffering in silence uh, when literally all you needed was a definition on a screen and it jumped out at you like, whoa, that's, that's me. That's what I have. That's this, this thing called anxiety or generalized anxiety or whatever the detail is specific to you. Um, w- was there anyone that you, that you tried to reach out to uh, perhaps a teacher, a family member, uh, that they didn't have the education around what to call this thing or what to name it. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you guys are making uh, great points. I think the you know, a, 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 the biggest shift I've seen is that we moved from people feeling that we're protecting others by not talking about these types of things to realizing that no, we're not protecting them by not talking about it. We're kind of like crippling. Uh, their ability to uh, to get uh, help. Um, I hadn't. I didn't really try to tell anybody until uh, my late teens when I finally uh, told a friend. Um, I didn't really try to tell anybody that I uh, wasn't feeling great, you no know, family members, friends, or anything like that, because I didn't want. I knew I didn't want sympathy. Uh, and I, I, when I speak to other people who have you know been able to go through mental health battles, this I hear this a lot from them too. So I didn't want sympathy. I didn't want people to uh, treat me differently. And I also wasn't sure that I could uh, explain what was going on. So mm-hmm. between all of those things, there's a lot of forces uh, keeping me uh, keeping me silent. And I- Keeping you in the shadows, with, essentially. Yeah. That's really what, which is, you know, <laughs> what did your friend, what was, what was it about your friend or the relationship or, um, that, that he created for you um, to facilitate you disclosing to him um, such a dominating emotion. And for others listening, this might be something so simple and practical or maybe something more complex, but what was it about the dynamic of that friendship that allowed you there, um, which, which opened up you know, your mind's eye to the resolution, um, to the success, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so is a really, uh, he was a really close friend and he had also uh he had gone through uh some uh different um you know uh, medical issues himself that you know were didn't similar to me the medical issues i go through his medical issues didn't define him didn't change uh who he was it was just some you know unfortunate stuff he had to deal with so i feel like that enabled him to understanding and that was kind of unique and he was also just uh just a really great um listener non-judgmental I feel like all those things I got from him. I thought worst case scenario, I won't be judged. Um, if all else fails, I won't be judged. I that's what I would think. So the connection you felt with him. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I, you know, it's not it's not even that complicated. This this friend is an extraordinary person. He's 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 incredible. You don't have to be incredible to you know tell somebody or just call somebody you haven't spoken to in a little bit and say how are you. Uh, or, or somebody who you know might be going through a tough time and saying the words, how are you? There's just so many wild stories out there uh, about the, that demonstrate the power that uh, those words have. So it's not like you have to think, oh, I have to be this you know, incredible person. It's real simple, uh, just, just uh, checking in with people. During the pandemic, I personally had a program, uh, you know, certainly the beginning of it, 
uh, where every day three people, I checked in with them and just asked how everything's going, how they're holding up. Um, and maybe I should pick that back up again. That's um, beautiful. <laughs> but I think one of the lessons you're saying that, that I'm learning is the notion of non-judgmental listening. So, right, if you have a friend who says to you, you know, I, I want to share with you something that sometimes I'm I'm feeling this way or thinking this way, you don't say, well, why do you think that way or snap out of it? Or that's a ridiculous way to think. Or, you know, you're saying that what made your friend a safe place was non-judgmental listening. He listened, he heard you, he validated you, he supported you. And, and not every problem needs a solution and not, not every listening is to offer advice, non-judgmental, just listening real active listening that you can hear a person and validate where they're at and show them the love and the support and give them the space they need to address what they're going through. That, that is something that we could all do better as, as friends. Could you share with us a little bit more detail of, right? So this, this friend heard you, you know, you found, you figured out this is what's going on. You made an appointment and you said you started taking some medicine that helped you plus some therapy that helped you. Did you see the, the results pretty quickly? Um, when did you share with others in your life that or, did you and when did you, I guess, with family that, you know, you, you've realized you had this, this diagnosis, you're treating it, you feel great. And, and what are some of the strategies that you use even until today? You're, you're a management role in an accounting firm, you know, you're a yeshiva graduate, you're, you're, you're a regular, successful, amazing. So how do you manage? What are the tools that you use even to this day to manage it? Yeah, so speak to the, uh, the tools uh, part, certainly specifically. Uh, a big deal for me for moving past, uh, you know, the unnatural anxiety was un identifying what the unnatural thinking patterns were. And I, I certainly got a lot of help with this uh, in uh, with, with the therapist, which I made an appointment for. And to another one of your questions, uh, thank God, um, things moved very well, pretty quickly with the uh, with, with the therapist. Um, and um, which motivates me to speak up uh, because I want to be that education or that discussion, which wasn't out there. Uh, but some things which works for me uh, to get back to that point is, uh, so I would identify the unnatural thinking patterns and I would internally challenge them. I would be like, is that a really a fair or an accurate way uh, to think about it? And even if I couldn't stop myself from, you know, just, oh, just sometimes just going straight towards the most negative or the most anxious um, you know, plausible outcome. If somebody, uh, you know, like if a, a friend looked at me a certain way, oh, this friend never wants to speak to me again. Even if I couldn't help myself from going to the disaster, at the least what I said I would do is I'm going to consider the most positive, maybe outrageously positive, which is that oh, maybe this friend's looking at me because uh, uh, they just realized that, you know, I'm the best friend there is to be in the whole world. They just had that thought. Probably not either of them. They're probably aren't even even looking at me. Maybe they're checking the clock in the room. Um, but uh, that that's something which uh, which helped me. Uh, other things which helped me is you know, and I, I know a lot of people uh, with mental health challenges. Um, they don't uh, take uh, compliments very well. They often uh, deflect them. And so I just made a rule for myself. Any compliment I got, I would just say thank you very much. Nothing more. Nothing less. Uh, those, those are things which uh, which work for me. I could go on, but the truth is that the big time key is that if you think maybe just maybe you're having an unnatural thinking pattern, uh, to see a mental health doctor, a psychologist, and get it checked up. Hopefully, it will be nothing, but maybe uh, it will be something that you can work on to improve uh, your quality of life. And as with all medical situations, you know, the earlier that it could be spotted, the better. But uh, there's certainly no point where it's it's too late. It's um, but so always you know seek out um, pro you know, some professional guidance or guidance from a friend if if you think maybe there's something you know most, the worst that could happen maybe it'll be nothing. Hey Tom, now that you have some of those tools to help you with you know day to day challenges that come up and those those triggers as far as what stimulate negative thinking, etc. Um, can you talk a little bit to the quality of life now compared to what it was? years back when you were in, you know, when you were in the, in the, in the thick of it. Yeah. Um, like what's your day to day look like, you know, with, w w through implementing these tools um, and, and achieving some success and navigating the mental health challenge of anxiety versus being stuck, you know, with, with the paralyzing emotion of it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, <laughs> It's basically like what I would dream of when I was a teenager, you know, the, those good times, always having those good times, not having those bad times. So it's you know, my wildest dreams have 
uh, come true from that regard. And in terms of, you know, management I do now, I think I'm sure there is management I'm subconsciously doing. Uh, and you know, probably there's there are times when I consciously, you know, make sure to put myself only in positions to uh, succeed. But, you know, fortunately, there's really good uh, people out there and treatment out there for uh, with mental health, um, whether it's uh, therapy or some help with medication. Um, and, you know, it will work quicker, quickly, and really effective for some people and slowly and really uh, uh, pain and really frustrating for other people. So the whole exp- the therapeutic experience for you wasn't that long. It was, it was something that you, you addressed, um, you, you know, it was brief treatment of sorts. Um, you implemented some of the tools and now, you know, feel like you resolved that, that issue. Yeah, I, I did it for about a year because uh, I, 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 I felt like as long as there's more room to have progress, then, mm-hmm. um, then I'm, I'm all for it. I want to do it. And I mean, that's also another point. You can't always be chasing perfection or else you'll always be chasing it. And once you hit what you thought was perfection, uh, then uh, you'll realize, no, this isn't perfection. Perfection is really two rungs, two rungs above that. So at a certain point, you've, <laughs> uh, there's a point of being satisfied. Um, but I definitely, you know, I, I worked so hard to get into uh, therapy, get to the point in my life. I wasn't going to, uh, you know, cut it, uh, what I felt might be short. But it is important to say that that anxiety, mental health, it's never really cured or solved as much as it is managed. So yeah. even even if you didn't need that level of therapy in an ongoing way, you're continue to be very self aware um, of that, and that and that you're managing it so that the best way to 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 do well with it is to manage it and never feel like I'm done with it. Yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, a- absolutely, uh, it's you know it's something which uh, you know mental health challenges uh, or mental illness will always be uh, some form of uh, part of you and management uh, never stops just hopefully and and, prob- and uh, people should be able to get to the point where it kind of almost fades into the background they hardly even notice it let's let's just talk about stigma and shame for a moment which is really the motivator behind this out of the shadows our podcast yeah um and, and i know you feel strongly about this it's just to echo what moshe said when we began the, the courage that you have to be here you know it's not it's not a simple thing and it should be because anxiety is generalized anxiety is no more your fault than somebody's got asthma or diabetes or has a broken leg it's their fault um you know and yet society is designed to um, show sympathy and empathy and support and care and concern for the person who has the the physical malady and the person who has the, the mental challenge um, you know, there's a lot of shame attached, a lot of stigma in the world of Shiduchim. It can be something which which guides people um, negatively. So, you know, can you talk to that, how, how you experience that and how you've overcome that, right? The fact that you're willing to be in this conversation that will be seen by thousands and thousands of people and you're willing to put your face and name attached to it with pride and know, Eitan, and I know you do know this, know that you're helping people. By doing this and the courage to do this, there are people watching and listening who will now go address it in a way that will change their lives for the better forever and more power to you. You should be incredibly blessed for that courage, but speak to that, that stigma and what it is to overcome that shame to be willing to do this. Yeah. Thank you so much for those kind words, uh, Rabbi Goldberg. Uh, I was uh, assured that this will be seen by millions of people and now you're telling me uh-huh. thousands. Um, <laughs> billions, billions. Just kidding. Billions. Okay. You're right. It was billions. We were both wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So the stigma actually uh, kind of almost cracks me up. It's, it's, it, it's funny in a lot of ways uh, uh, because if you think about it, it's a walking contradiction and here's some evidence for you that indisputably there's bad information out there about mental health. Uh, so there, there's there's two big types of stigma which people will deal with. Type number one is that there is no such thing as a medical type anxiety or depression or OCD or whatever. Uh, just move on from your bad day. Everyone gets nervous sometimes, suck it up, et cetera. So that's a type of stigma which you know, is out there and we're making progress on. Another type of stigma which is out there is when somebody says, whoa, this person has battled OCD in the past. That person is not the right fit for um, my daughter. So which is it? Are mental health challenges non-existent 
or are they so severe and so serious that we need to section those people off who who battle them and have or and have and have dealt with them at some point and not let them uh, date our children? Uh, so you know, <laughs> usually people aren't thinking both thoughts at once. So maybe it's not even the same person thinking both times, but this is just to me it's indisputable evidence that there is bad information out there about mental health because if you took all these uh, stigmatic viewpoints they don't add up um and in terms of an example i've seen you talk about uh dating this is um uh, uh this is really at home a few years ago uh, so there's a shop who emailed me she was really excited about my dating avail availability and how she had all sorts of exciting uh girls she wanted to run by me uh, the first girl she suggests, I say, uh, you know what, I would actually be interested in theory, but I talked to a different Shah Khan a couple months ago, and this girl wasn't interested. We'll call her Sarah to use a generic name. So the Shah Khan says, well, if you'd like, I could try to push it with uh, Sarah, but, and we could see what happens. But if not, I have many other girls that would be a good match for you. I said, sure, push it. Okay. So later that day, I get an email back from this new Shah Khan. And she says, I just spoke with Sarah. She heard really nice things about you and was interested. Her parents apparently heard that you take medication and they felt that this wouldn't be a match for their daughter. So I guess that ends that. Sarah is a no-go. I will definitely keep you in mind for other ideas though. And that was the last time I ever heard from that Shadchan. Um, and so that really hit close to home and uh, that really broke my heart, not for me uh, and the Sarah situation, though. I mean, I don't know. It's probably not a great uh, situation with Sarah and parents. Or, I don't know. That's a separate topic. But it broke my heart that to know that that is a mindset still out there that people have to battle through. I very firmly believe that it's not something which is going to hold me back, thank God. But uh, just the fact that something totally out of people's control, which totally doesn't define them, uh, would hold them back. Um, and, you know, there's been other examples, but I think the way to, you talk about accepting the stigma, one, there's been so much improvement. Uh, so it's kind of easy to accept when you see all these organizations which have popped up seemingly overnight, uh, all, you know, the uh, leaders uh, such as yourselves who are uh, willing to uh, discuss this, uh, whether it's from a halakh viewpoint or an everyday point of view, or an, as it pertains to people's everyday lives. Uh, so that makes it easy to uh, move past it. But so it's getting better. But ultimately, uh, and this might be hard, understandably, for a lot of people, but it's just to accept that there are people with uh, the wrong uh, or just not properly informed viewpoints out there yet who haven't had the opportunity yet to um, expose themselves to the, all the information which is out there. And I know it's difficult, but. So you just got to accept that it's uh, it's not going to be a total click with everybody. But you've also got to uh, be thankful for uh, the uh, the great things which having which going through mental health struggles uh, gives you. It gives you a resiliency, which I talked about, uh, and it gives you this unparalleled strength. There's not going to be anything which knocks you down. I remember sitting in uh, classes in college and. You know, a teacher said there's going to be a test next week and everyone in the room is panicking. How could you do this test? And I was like, you kidding me? This is a challenge. <laughs> like this is uh, this is going to knock you guys down. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so, yeah, that that there's definitely um, unique benefits and you know, being in touch with your emotions, which going through mental health challenges. That's another benefit, which which it gives you. So you know, just can also appreciate the good. Yeah, the world, the luxury of, of saying that, you know, I wouldn't want my daughter to date anyone on medicine. That luxury is going away because especially after the pandemic and, and, and in this episode, we're, we're talking also more broadly about some of the statistics and data of anxiety, how prevalent it is. You know, I don't know that there's a home, forget a Jewish home. I don't know that there's a home and, and after the pandemic. So, you know, that notion, any stigma that people want to attach to it is just going to boomerang and come back to bite them because there's no one immune, so to say, from the challenges that technology is presenting, a pandemic presents and that naturally occur and so we, we'd all do much better off to to learn to to navigate it to accept it support it and to realize that somebody who who has a, you know a mental health diagnosis and gets therapy takes medicine can be an infinitely better husband than the person who should be doing all those things but because of a stigma is ashamed to and so what because that person's not on medicine you want your daughter to marry them and then it turns out 
that, yeah. that their marriage is so flawed. It's not any better, but you know, it's something that needs a lot of work. We're heading in the right direction and we're, and we're working on it. And Anton, that point is so powerful that, you know, the, through persevering, um, you know, and, and really working through it, the, the, the muscle and the, just, just in general, every, through every dimension that you, that you build for coming that challenge and working through it, what it does to, to, to a person's strength, their ego strength and their personality type and their ability, their building, their ability to, to navigate future challenges. Uh, you, you know, you have currently a wider bandwidth to be able to navigate life in general, which is fantastic and such a, such a really rich point. Thank you. I, I agree with everything you've said, and yeah, I appreciate it. It is a great point. Eitan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your courage and your willingness. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, please, God, invite us to your Simcha and Mirza Shem soon and to good things. And uh, really wish you only Bracha and Mazel and, and Yashikoch on helping so many people by agreeing to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. so much again for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, that was really fantastic. I learned so much, not only learned so much about interacting with others, I learned so much that I'm so excited to try to implement for myself, whether it's how to be a non-judgmental friend and listener, the difference that made in Eitan's life, that someone validated, listened, supported, encouraged with no judgment. Or when Jessica talked about the, the role of connections, just feeling connected, sending a text message, checking in on someone, knowing there's a network of connection that saved her life, that saves lives when people feel connected to the whole idea of uh, not silencing the voice of uncertainty, but learning to live with that voice and to respond to that voice with thoughts of Amuna and faith and working on Amuna. There were some really practical tools and, and you know, I'm so excited to try to be more sensitive to others and to work on these things for myself. I got a lot out of these conversations. Yeah, I mean, it was so empowering to, to know that there are, there are real solutions to these issues uh, and the solutions that both, they both outlined, um, Eitan sharing, it just took one listening ear. And it blew open his entire his entire recovery, essentially, um, from identifying, from putting language to anxiety, and then ultimately to resolving what he was paralyzed with. Um, and Jessica as well talked about groups and how that creates uh, an environment of safety and, and it reinforces, um, you know, the, the individual, man, you know, managing whatever the anxiety that they're anxious, the feelings that they're struggling with. So, so, so practical, so helpful and so empowering for us on the outside. Um, to, to go over to our friends, our family members, uh, people at shul, people in the shop, you know, in the supermarket and say, hey, what's going on? And if they do share, to utilize that as a, as a, as a, as a to jumpstart, um, you know, on an educational level, as well as on a support uh, platform as well. And, and we can encourage you strongly. You know, we've gotten phenomenal feedback. You know, thank God there was an enormous a group that watched and listened to our, our opening episode. And we've gotten great feedback. And it's really encouraging us to continue uh, once a month to take another topic, to interview real people, to give some real tools. Um, we're, we're really grateful for that. But if, if you're listening, you know, if you don't identify with any of this, then then be a better friend for those who do, a family member. And if you do identify with it and, and you're working on it, continue that work. And, and if you're not, you know, you get that help. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. It could change your life. I was really disturbed reading uh, Jewish um, media, a Jewish uh, magazine over, over Yontif that, you know, posed, uh, sometimes they have hypothetical scenarios. And it was a girl who came up from seminary who thought she could benefit from talking to a therapist and mm -hmm. asked her mother who said, don't, because it'll hurt your shidduchim. And the conclusion of the article was try to find other ways to work on that, but don't go see a therapist because the stigma, it'll hurt your shidduch. That's not the answer. You, yeah. you, you'll make a much better wife or husband, mother or father when you are, are build up the tools to manage these things in life than if you deny that they're there. So there are solutions, there's help. There's a much brighter future and a better life for everyone who's willing to, to have the humility and the courage to tackle these things. And we can't encourage you strongly enough to do so. To come out of the shadows and to share what's going on with, with people that you trust or even random people that you feel can, you know, can help you and support you through that process. Rabbi, I thought of a tagline for this, uh, for this show here. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think. Um, you know, the whole, the whole end of here is to, is to help break that, that stigma and to, to, to create um, the, the reality that mental health is real, it's present, it's in our community, and we're trying to remove the Shanda associated with it. Um, so I was thinking a tagline. I'm going to try it here with you. This is the first time. Share it. Don't fear it. I like it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Out of the shadows. Share it. Don't fear it. Into the light. It's great. Anyway. It's amazing. So Moshe, thank you for your partnership. We're looking forward to next month. Continue yes. to be in touch with us. 
Uh, if you've got feedback, we've I've learned a lot from the feedback that we've gotten. Um, if you have feedback, if you have further ideas, if you're for willing to, to share your story. Yeah, need for clarification, you know, my our emails are going to be attached on the notes. Uh, please reach out. Uh, we, will, we will be available uh, to address any follow-up questions or concerns and, and the courage of the two that really share their stories. Thank you again. And we, we want to invite others as well. If you feel like your message can help others, please reach out. Um, looking forward to, to next month. All right. Be well, everybody. Don't fear it. Share it. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed this episode of Out of the Shadows. To help bring the show to a wider audience, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe and find more episodes of Out of the Shadows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. For further resources, be sure to check out the show notes.